Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Chevron. Chevron celebrates innovators and entrepreneurs who create, build, and do. And Chevron is finding better ways to do what they do to help keep doers doing. Start your day tomorrow with Up First, the morning news podcast from NPR. Apple podcast reviewer Eve Bethel calls it, quote, concise and comprehensive. I listen to Up First every morning on my walk to work. It gives me a great summary of the top news stories during the day and the upcoming week. Wake up with Up First tomorrow morning on the NPR One app or wherever you listen to podcasts. What's up, everybody? This is Stretch Armstrong. And my name is Bobito Garcia, a.k.a. Cool Bob Love. Welcome to What's Good with Stretch and Bobito, your source for untold stories and uncovered truths from movers and shakers around the world. Tonight, we are coming to you live from NPR headquarters in Washington, D.C. If you have not eaten tonight, you may want to leave the room right now. (laughs) Because we are going to get into some really, really deep narratives that are going to make you want to eat. Joining us now, the man who put Washington, D.C. on the culinary map, Chef Jose Andres. Give it up. (laughs) So, Jose, you started your career in Spain at one of the most fabled and influential restaurants ever, El Bulli. Then you ended up in New York for a short stint. You see and then how you, happy he got? Huh? <laughs> he got really happy with it. Because I said it right. <laughs> um, and then you, you kept going south, and you ended up in Washington, D.C., which in the early 90s was not exactly a culinary destination. Did you see that as a challenge, and how were you hoping to impact the city? Yes, I came from Spain. I was very young, but we need almost to go back three years. The restaurant you mentioned, El Bulli, Ferran Adria, he will be the guy that will be able to see in a glass of water things that we never, ever dreamt. He was able to move cooking for three centuries. We were only three, four people with him, but became the most influential restaurant in the 20th century. So imagine that when the Big Bang happened, when the universe is created. Imagine when you feel... 30 something years later that you were there in that moment with something amazing happened. So if you don't know Ferran Adria and you never heard about El Bulli, that's why you are listening to the show of these two guys. <laughs> because you're learning about what's good. <laughs> Bang! That was, that, was a, that was a beautiful answer. Um, it was, that was to a different question. <laughs> But we were just curious about coming to D.C., which was not a culinary destination. No, true. And was, and, okay. Thanks for the script, guys. (laughs) But you're right in a way. But I'm tired of saying D.C. was not a great city. Yes, we had, yes, we had uh, state houses and potatoes, but, but listen to me. We, we had amazing people. We had a French guy that nobody could understand a word, very much like my English, called Jean-Louis Paladin, which was the best French chef in the history of French cooking, working at the Watergate. We had a guy called Yannick Kam, happened another French guy, and believe me, I don't praise French people easily. <laughs> <laughs> we had an amazing woman, Nora Pujon. The woman that believed that local and organic was amazing almost 40 years ago before organic became a word. That began here, not in California. I love California. We had Bob Kincaid, the best American chef, making mid-Atlantic cooking before mid-Atlantic cooking was a thing. We had so many amazing things going on when I arrived here that they get very upset when they tell me nothing was happening in D.C. Hello, I learned from all of them. Mm. And No, no, I mean it. Well, Jose, you have 25 restaurants throughout cities. 
around the world. You were Time Magazine 100 Most Influential People. Uh, you also received the National Humanities Medal from the National Endowment for the Humanities. You arrived in the United States in 1991. Now, I have met many of people growing up in New York, being raised there, who arrived in this country, perhaps with master's degrees, PhDs, and weren't able to pursue what they had studied when they arrived here. You know, might have just worked odd end jobs to, to make ends meet just because, you know, what they had, what their skill set was, couldn't be realized here. I know other people who arrived here in this, in this country who didn't have any training, didn't have any skill set, but found hands-on experience, education here, and have been able to, to really raise themselves up from what they might not have expected. Um, I'm interested in, in your narrative, arriving here in 91 with the resources that you did have upon arrival and then becoming the, as successful What's well, so up? You ready to answer that? <laughs> Go for it. I mean, NPR is known by very long questions. Arriving in the U.S., <laughs> what powered your drive for, for your career upon arrival? <laughs> I came with $50. That was a very important moment for me. Coming to New York as a young boy, working hard next to many many amazing people, many of them probably undocumented. But today that we are having this moment about DACA dreamers, 25 years later, I only learned one thing. America, more often than not, is running on the shoulders of those people that have no papers. And the big lie is that our senators and congressmen are having salads every day right here on the hill where their salads are picked by people that are working undocumented. And the big lie is that that's okay, but that's not any different form of slavery that we, we've been trying to escape as a country for so many centuries already. And that the best thing for America to do because it's the right thing to do is that immigration reform is not it's not really a problem but the, uh, for us to solve, but it's an opportunity for us to seize. Did I answer your question? You nailed it. Sure. <laughs> Being at you. So, Jose, you became a citizen in 2013. What made you decide to become a U.S. citizen when you did? I knew always I wanted to come here. I always thought that the stars in the American flag, they were equal to the amazing night a starry sky where by watching the sky at night you will feel freedom you will feel that america was this amazing big place where everybody had an opportunity and was welcome so you ask me why my wife and i we decided to become american citizens it's because this has become my home we have three American born daughters and still to this day, I believe that America is exactly that, a beautiful night sky with those beautiful stars that send the message to every single person in America and beyond that we are the country that fights for the values we all dream of. Honesty, hard work, we are all one, we are all equal, and nobody is above anybody else because color, race, religion, or political party. That's why I wanted to become part of America. Beautiful. Do your daughters identify with being Spaniard? This is a question they probably will answer themselves. Uh, my wife and I, we've been trying to raise them to understand where they born, to understand that they also, they are a bridge from where their father and mother came from. And I'm not doing that because I want them to have many flags to believe in or to be, but I do believe we need to start investing the time in the young people of America to tell them that we are where we born and where we came from, but that we need to start connecting to places far away because it's the only way to be understanding the world. I've been in many countries around the world, and I only know 
that I am who I am because I know that beyond that horizon that we see every day on sunrise and sunset, it's always something else. And my life is about knowing what's beyond the horizon. And by going through that amazing road of trying to learn what's beyond the horizon, I don't know, I am uncomfortable. But you know one thing? Life starts at the end of your comfort zone. For that, you need to move away from where you belong and where you feel comfortable. That way, you are helping create a better world. More What's Good Live from Washington, D.C. coming up in just a minute. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Red Bull Radio. Whether it's the latest dance hall out of Kingston, techno from Berlin, underground hip-hop, or old soul gems, Red Bull Radio is the place to tune in and discover great music that's new to you. With in-depth interviews and live performances from festivals around the globe, plus music handpicked by influential artists, journalists, and DJs, You'll know what you're looking for when you hear it. Listen at redbullradio.com. We recently interviewed Anna Navarro, who told us that... I love Anna. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't want to be with her in the room. (laughs) Well, she told us that she knew that she was an American once she started enjoying peanut butter. So, curious if there's a, a guilty American food pleasure that you have. You know one thing? I mean, listen to me. Oh, man, I hope they cannot take my citizenship away for this. <laughs> but my daughters love peanut butter, and as a father, I endorse the liking. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but we are producing some of the best oysters anywhere in the world, right here at home, not too far away. I think oysters are the food of the people. So my guilty pleasure, oysters. I know many of you like peanut butter, but between peanut butter and oysters, give me a break. (laughs) But I should do a peanut butter and oyster sandwich. (laughs) Now we're talking. (laughs) You sure about that? (laughs) He's he's the, he's a dude that try anything. I so. mean, if 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 he shoves a plate of of peanut butter oyster sandwiches in front of my face, I'm I'm gonna try it. Trust me. If I'm saying peanut butter and oysters will be a good sandwich, believe me, it'll be a good sandwich. Uh, I don't <laughs> doubt it. You've done a lot of humanitarian work. You went to Haiti after the earthquake. You've worked with the D.C. Central Kitchen, and most recently, you've been in Texas for helping feed victims of Hurricane Harvey. What's the most memorable moment where you felt, man? We're really doing work here. Well, This is Android Kitchen was created by Robert Egger, my hero, my mentor, my friend, a guy that on Ronald Reagan inauguration day pick up all the leftover food in every single hotel, ballroom, food that wasn't touched, brought it to a central kitchen and began distributing the, uh, that food that was untouched to churches, soup kitchens, Today, this is Central Kitchen feeds between five and 8,000 people a day. And I'm so proud of being part of that. Um, that, you know, after the earthquake, I was in Cayman Islands with my family and I felt I had to go to Haiti. And I've been in many hurricanes. I've been in few earthquakes, but I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I, I feel bad at times because where I go is only to learn from precisely the stories that sometimes we don't tell. When somebody is trying to tell us up from the White House that America is not awesome, but because I don't want to use the word G. By me going there, I see that America is awesome in every single F way. So we all know how difficult the restaurant business is. You know, food is expensive, profit margins are very thin, yet you have managed to create this incredibly successful mini empire in D.C. and and outside of D.C. Yet you've leveraged much of your success for humanitarian causes, as we've just been talking about. Are the restaurants now a means to an end? (laughs) I don't have a clue sometimes where I want to go. Today I saw, I read a story about Mark Zuckerberg. Is one little guy that came up with this naughty idea to connect people. Give me a break. <laughs> Why? 
And the story was a negative story. The story was Mark Zuckerberg may be losing the control of his own company because he's donating so much of his wealth to charity. We keep giving value to the money we have in the bank. But more and more I'm learning that the true value is really what's the power that every one of us has to impact the lives of others. And if you tell me right now how a man and a woman can show how rich they are, I will tell you that in the 21st century, the American dream is going to be based not in how much money you have personally, but in how many people you can touch with your know-how and your actions. That's what I believe on. So you ask me, what's the end of my company? Of sure, I want to be wealthy, rich, that I don't know what to do with the money. <laughs> Fuck fundraisers. I don't want a fundraise. I want to be used acting and coming up with ideas to help the people of the world. About 10 years ago, I had my first visit to Barcelona in España. And a friend of mine took me to a restaurant. She's like, we're going to get the best paella that you've ever had in your life. I was like, all right, cool. Let's, you know, I'm, let's go. Let's go for it. She's my treat. I'm like, what? Cool. <laughs> we get to the restaurant. There's a plaque on the floor. I'm reading the plaque. The restaurant had been founded and had been stayed consistently in business since like the 1820s. I got nervous to walk inside. I was like, this restaurant is older than some countries. When you know about that type of legacy that, that the food of your country has, and now you're, you're meshing it into other nationalities and other cuisines, and you know, here in the States as an American citizen, not that it's a burden, but how do you approach that type of legacy and carrying it forward? Spain is a small country in size compared to America, not very big. But the truth is that in the moment you drive 50 kilometers, everything changes. The language may change, the cooking changed dramatically. And this is very, very special and very unique because food, in my case, I'm a chef. I am who I am thanks to not the food itself, but the histories and the people that made that food possible. When I came to America, finally to stay in 93, and began doing tapas, not topless. <laughs> I told a guy, I work in a tapas place, and he tells me, what, are you the bouncer? Say, <laughs> say sir, tapas, tapas. That's real, that happened. <laughs> I began telling the history of where I came from. And I shared it with my new city. And I saw that food had this amazing way to be connecting me with people. When I opened my Turkish restaurant, my Peruvian, my Mexican, my Chinese Mexican, well, I didn't invent it. It's a city in Mexico called Mexicali where Mexicans and Ch Chinese moved into that town because they wanted to send them back to China. At the beginning of 1900s, they stayed there, and today it's 3,000 people, Chinese descent, making Mexican Chinese cooking. I didn't make it up, it's real. So I only see the power of food and how cooks, chefs, or anybody that cooks has the power to tell stories from where they come from, the stories that sometimes they are centuries old, and giving them a new meaning in today, and somehow showing us a way into the future we are going to. We don't only feed the body, but we also are trying to feed the soul. Jose, so I'm, I'm vegan. What? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know, I'm vegan, and, and, and as a vegan, I, I experience my share of, of pushback, which is another, which is a nice way of saying hostility. Um, tell us about a transcendent food experience you've had with either a vegan or vegetarian dish. Yeah, I love vegetables. I mean, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Who likes beef? 
Raise your hand. Come on, people. Man, you're destroying the planet. <laughs> you buy your piece of meat. You're powerful. Because you can afford what no other person on earth can. Because your beef was raised two, three, four years. Ate the grass that was fed by the sun and the water of the clouds. And on top of that, we gave them corn and wheat. So you bought a very big piece of beef. <laughs> and we never see women grilling. I don't know why. It's always the man that grills. Why? Because that's the way it's done in America. <laughs> but the woman is the smart one. She's drinking her gin and tonic. <laughs> And the man is making a fool of himself because he doesn't know how the grill works. <laughs> and the meat is served in the table, and you cut a piece, and conversation stops. Why? Because we are lions. You put the piece of meat in your mouth, and you start munching. <laughs> The first five seconds, glory, ecstasy, juices flowing around your mouth, your tongue saying what's going on, your nose is like, baby, give me some, it's sniff it. <laughs> but then that moment of glory goes away. You will suck in like Dracula all the juices, and then you will get that piece of S-H-I-T and throw it away as far as you could from your esophagus and your stomach. So, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that if you did the same thing with a pineapple, life will be happiness. Because from the second you put the pineapple in contact with your skin, using your hands, you will sense that the pineapple is cold and fresh and wet and you put it in contact with your lips, and your lips are like, baby, what's going on? <laughs> and your teeth, they want, baby, lips, let me get in touch with her, and you bite, and the teeth are like, wow, and your tongue is like, what's going on? Sweet, acidity, and you munch, and every moment is happiness. And your esophagus is saying, baby, I want some. Every moment is unbelievable. So, why we keep beloving meat so much when the true pleasures of life are happening with the humble fruits and vegetables that Mother Earth gives us in such a natural way. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Red Bull Radio. Whether it's the latest dance hall out of Kingston, techno from Berlin, underground hip hop, or old soul gems, Red Bull Radio is the place to tune in and discover great music that's new to you. With in-depth interviews and live performances from festivals around the globe, plus music handpicked by influential artists, journalists, and DJs, you'll know what you're looking for when you hear it. Listen at redbullradio.com. I'll say is the time in our show for the are oh, you already know <laughs> the impression session. Are you ready for the impression session, Jose? I'm gonna make a fool of myself. No, not at all. No, but I'm gonna know what that means. Are you gonna help me? Yeah. So each of us is gonna play for you a song, and you get to react any way you like, as if you needed for us to tell you that. <laughs> Tradition, modernity, coming together in this amazing place where Bobino and Stretch are telling us the all is good, the mother is great. 
I don't eat no meat, no dairy, no sweets Only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat I'm from the old school, my household smell like soul food, bruh Curry full of food, okay. barbecue tofu, no fish So, Jose, that song is by a group called Dead Prez It was released in 1999 And uh, the title is Be Healthy The reason why I chose that record to play for you Personally, when I heard that, it really transformed my approach towards food and eating. And I had some limited awareness, but the lyrics were so powerful and the way it was presented and, and so sincere that I really stepped away from hearing that song that first day and, and made a change. I'm wondering, first of all, what you thought of the record, what your reaction beyond your wonderful dancing. <laughs> and then secondly, I want to know if there was a song in your history that hits you in that certain way that transforms your approach towards food? Wow. Well, I learned English listening to songs. <laughs> and still my accent, look at. But it's funny you will say that this song, for me, the music, that classic guitar, amazing, thank you. I know that was kind of a match from the place I come from. The rhythm is a rhythm I love. Probably this type of rhythm, call it hip hop, call it rap. It's a rhythm. I'm the happiest cooking in my house. And those mentions of food and vegetables and things, I mean, it's what I've been doing all night. I mean, you know, number one, if I ask you what I have in my glass right now, who said water? Water. <laughs> Some people will say vodka. I am vegetarian too. This is made out of corn. And is made in Austin. I didn't mention it. <laughs> so you're saying, Jose, what are you drinking? And I will answer you, corn on the cob. <laughs> in life, it's all about how you tell the story. I am not drinking. I am a vegetarian, a vegan, and I'm enjoying what Mother Nature making music and the way chefs might approach inventing dishes have similarities. What do you think, Jose? <laughs> I think a lot of things. <laughs> I think a lot of things. Funny, great moments with, with bands and musicians. But I remember I was invited to a wedding. I offered as my wedding gift to cook for my friend. And that was Salma Hayek. And Bono from YouTube was there. It just and happened we were to be in there. this amazing theater. And you know, what Bono does in the wedding of his friend, well, he sings at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, where all the, you know. Corn on the cob. Corn on the cob. <laughs> Cobbed up. And Bono is singing, and he brings me the, the microphone, and, and I keep singing. And at the end of the song, he comes and says, you know, that's very interesting, but I think you're the first one that ever takes the microphone away from me. <laughs> <laughs> but what this is only telling me is that music has this amazing moment to be a soundtrack. I've always tried to play my life through the m soundtracks of the moments. And I've learned that the bad moments are better because I have a soundtrack I like, and the best moments are greater because I have music. So that's what this is telling me. Beautiful. Well, Jose, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for giving us your time and talking to us. I hope. I hope the next time we speak, it's over a fantastic table of food that is of your creation. Everyone, please, aplauso, aplauso para Jose Andres. That's our show. This podcast was produced by Nigeri Eaton, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Franny Mohanan, and Sammy Yenigan, and was edited by Steve Nelson. Our executive producer is Abby O'Neill. Special thanks to our engineers, Josh Rogerson, Kevin Waite, and Andy Huther. If you like the show, you can hear more on NPR One. Check out our interviews with Rosie Perez and Eric Hayes, as well as Hill Harper. Peace! Peace. <laughs>